Israeli forces say that they have encircled Gaza City as media in the country reports troops are expected to move in within the next 48 hours for what's likely to be a fierce battle with Hamas. And right now, internet and phone services are being restored in Gaza after a communications blackout. Our Deborah Pata is following the latest from Jerusalem. So let's start there, uh, Deborah. We know that there was a communications uh, blackout. Um, certainly that is going to have an impact on the messaging that Israel has been trying to get out, which is you need to leave the area. Israel is saying that not only is Gaza City surrounded, but they've essentially cut Gaza in half, uh, the north and the south, and they'd like to see people move south. But how did this communication blackout impact or hamper that message? I, I hardly think that's the main concern in many ways for the people mm. in Gaza. They can't even speak to each other. So actually, whether that message gets through or not, they know how bad it is. They know how severe it is in the north, and people are trying to flee. Um, they are trying to leave it. They're trying to get any way they can, whether it's on foot, on um, um, donkey carts. Mm -hmm. They're trying to flee from there. Um, and the problem, I think, for them is that when the Internet is cut, as soon as there is a barrage of renewed gunfire, the instinctive thing is that people want to phone their families. They want to phone and say, how are you? Are you mm -hmm. safe? Do you need help? They're not able to do that. The other problem with the cutting of the Internet is that people, if families are hit and they need help, they cannot call for their help. So that is the first thing that people are battling with when the communications are cut. The messaging about getting to the south, people know that. They're trying to get there. But it's difficult. Right. And, you know, we showed some video of people walking down the main highway. As, as, as I understand it, you can drive, but really only to a certain point. And so then after that, you have to walk. And obviously, the, the, the people who have the ability to walk like that after being pummeled, in the, being caught in the middle of this war for nearly a month now, I mean, it's, a lot of people are not going to be able to, to make it south is what I'm trying to sort of get to. And I think that's what you're seeing, Anne-Marie, is that people are going anywhere they can. If they can't walk and they have a wheelchair, they go in the wheelchair. They're piling people onto the back of donkey carts. But we've seen people who have injuries, who've sustained injuries, maybe not severe enough to go to hospital, but certainly difficult injuries that make it really, really hard to walk for long distances, to walk for hours and hours on end. There are about um, 1.5 million people, according to the United Nations, who are displaced, another 700,000 sheltering in UN schools, and even some of those schools have been hit. So that walk, that battle to get to safety in and of itself is perilous. And even as people run, they're saying they're seeing bodies on the ground, some of them decomposing. People can't get to those bodies. So even if you are injured and could perhaps go to help, actually getting to those bodies becomes very, very difficult. We've seen people as they flee have explosions around them. It's always that terrible choice, isn't it? Do you stay and risk the bombardment? Do you run and risk further peril? Yes, uh, Deborah, um, thank you very much. The terror attacks in Israel on October 7th and the government's response have sharpened the intense political divisions in the country. Many Israelis blame Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for what is happening less than a year after he regained power with the help of a controversial right-wing coalition. Over the weekend, Netanyahu suspended his heritage minister after he suggested dropping an atomic bomb on Gaza. Our Ramey Nascencio is in Tel Aviv in a place now called Captive Square or Hostage Square to honor those being held by Hamas. Good morning. In a new poll by an Israeli news station, 76% of Israelis, that's three out of four people, say Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu should resign, blaming him for the security failures of October 7th. Angry protesters paid Israel's prime minister a home visit, chanting, jail now. We, we Echoing cries across the country. He has to resign. He's lying again and again and again and again. Moshe Radman leads anti-Netanyahu protests. 
a leader needs to think 100% about our soldiers and our country and 0% about himself. And this is for sure not Netanyahu. Anger has snowballed against him for striking down the Supreme Court's independence this year for corruption charges from 2016. <laughs> And for billing himself as Mr. Security in political campaigns, saying he would take care of Israel's children. Now, more than three dozen of those children are believed to be among the hostages held by Hamas. October 7th is Israel's biggest security failure in 50 years. The prime minister has not apologized. Why has he not taken responsibility? He doesn't want to have anything on record saying he has responsibility for anything. Tal Schneider is political correspondent for the Times of Israel. He has uh, a followers, a base of uh, loyalists. And Netanyahu, as a prime minister, was uh, compared to President Trump. Netanyahu is much more sophisticated. But even still, Netanyahu may not be able to survive this time. Our country deserves better. Our people deserve better. Enough. Netanyahu has avoided taking any responsibility for the security failures of October 7th, but he has said he is responsible for winning the war. He is also saying that there is a time and place for investigation and blame Anne-Marie, but he says now is not that time. All right, Ramey, thank you.